How's the class of 07 doing tonight? Okay. The best thing about starting off here tonight is y'all don't have mallets in your hands, uh, so we can't be. But uh, how was that crab dinner? Was it all right? Good. All right. Okay, well, let, 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 let me just uh, give a little bit of intro about what we're going to be doing here tonight. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity and a speaker that you are going to thoroughly enjoy, and I hope you take some great lessons away. Uh, just to kind of put this in perspective, uh, remember last year, as part of the leadership uh, and development program, you started into a four-year program that's designed ultimately to produce leaders of character, and we'll continue to talk about that for the next four years here. And you did that by learning first what it meant to be a follower and get your first taste of leadership as a uh, fourth-class midshipman. And you also got a lot of lessons in the honor concept and your introduction to the to the, the first and the most important of the Navy's three core values, and that is honor. Now, as you're beginning third class year, the theme for this year, particularly in leader and character development, is the ethical leader, and then a focus on the second core value of the Navy, which is courage. And I will tell you that you'll all have the physical courage that you need at the time it comes in your career. The tougher one to develop is moral courage. And that's what you're going to hear a little bit about tonight, moral courage. And this year, you're going to learn a lot more about that in the ethics course, NE203, Moral Reasoning for the Naval Leader. Uh, and hopefully that will carry you on through the four-year program here at the Naval Academy. Now, I, I've talked about honor and leadership and effort. And we've talked about honor, courage, and commitment. And moral courage is one of those characteristics that you need to be working on hard while you're here at the Naval Academy. You'll encounter it every day here, and it, you'll be tested at, at times that are perhaps are unexpected or maybe expected, and only you know if you pass the test. That's one of the most interesting things, I think, about moral courage. Only you know if you pass the test. I won't even know. But if you take the time to reflect and test yourself and measure yourself, you'll know whether you're meeting my commandant standard, which I've talked about in some of those areas, and whether you're meeting your own standard for development. So tonight, we have two distinguished guests who are going to speak with us. And let me put this on context. On the morning of March 16, 1968, Chief Warrant Officer Hugh Thompson and his two-man crew of Larry Colburn and Glenn Andrada were flying over a tiny village known as My Lai in Vietnam. And what they saw from their helicopter horrified them, but at the same time it galvanized them into action. And it's a remarkable story, both about physical and moral courage. So this evening, you're going to learn more about that event and those three remarkable individuals, one of whom, Glenn Andriata, was killed in action soon after the events of my lie occurred on that fateful morning. The other two, Hugh Thompson and Larry Colburn, are our guests this evening. And they have been here before and talked to the Brigade of Midshipmen. And they've proven to be an invaluable resource and inspiration for our midshipmen in their development as future officers. So tonight's program will begin with a short video presentation, and then Mr. Thompson and Mr. Coburn will come on stage. They'll speak briefly, rather briefly, and then they're going to really open it up for you to ask them questions. Um, I'd like to thank the Ethics Center and those that work in the Ethics Center for making this all possible and supporting us in the character development programs here at the Naval Academy. I really ask that you pay close attention tonight. You're going to love this speaker. You're going to love the message. And I think this is one of the ones you'll remember later on in your career. So with that, we'll start the video. Thirty years ago this month, in one of the most shameful chapters in American military history, 504 unarmed Vietnamese women, children, and old men were massacred over a four-hour period by U.S. troops at a hamlet called My Lai in central Vietnam. And the carnage would have been even worse were it not for the valor of one American helicopter crew. They were so horrified by the sight of American soldiers slaughtering unarmed civilians that they put their own lives at risk to try to stop it. We went back to Milai with two of those American heroes who were honored earlier this month at the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington. 
It took this nation 30 years to recognize these men of conscience. That's Larry Colburn on the left, who was the gunner and the chopper. The other civilian is Hugh Thompson, the pilot. On that day 30 years ago, they landed in My Lai to rescue 11 Vietnamese civilians from massacre at the hands of American GIs. Thompson, according to the citation on his soldier's medal, was prepared to open fire on American troops to prevent them from murdering the Vietnamese civilians. I'm proudly and humbly accepted, not only for myself, but for all the men who served their country with honor on the battlefields of Southeast Asia. A third member of the crew, Glenn Andriotto, was honored posthumously. He was shot down and killed three weeks after the My Lai massacre. To try to understand what happened at My Lai, we asked Hugh Thompson and Larry Colburn to go back with us to Vietnam, and they told us there about that day 30 years ago, flying in their chopper low over My Lai, trying to draw enemy fire to protect the American GIs on the ground. What they saw from the air, they said, sickened them, shamed them. Young, inexperienced troops who'd been told that My Lai was an enemy stronghold were rounding up civilians, not taking prisoners. They burned down huts with their Zippo lighters, and then their leaders ordered them to line up the terrified villagers, gooks or dinks or slopes, they were called, and shoot them down in cold blood. The killing went on for four hours. Later, the army tried to cover up the fact that the victims, all of them, were unarmed women, old men, children. Even more would have been murdered if Thompson and Colburn had not intervened, landing their helicopter near a rice paddy to rescue some of the villagers. We were there at rice harvest time in Milai, just as it was back in March of 68. And little has changed since then. In fact, little has changed here in centuries. See the crew line where the houses are. That's one hamlet. This is another one. This yeah. would be another one. Yeah. This would be Thompson another. and Colburn were apprehensive at coming back. See how the bend would they be treated as outsiders, foreigners, the, the enemy? Oh, come here and let me see you. They found out when they visited the village primary school. It was Saturday, but classes were in session. Most of the children here didn't know who they were, but one of the older kids did. He asked Thompson about the massacre. Why is your colleague killed? It's a, it's a question that can never be answered. Uh, it was wrong, but I don't know. They, they went crazy. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, right? Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, after no. 30 years, excuse me. No, I'm not. It was not the last time Thompson would be overcome. There were reminders of the killings everywhere, a massive statue to the victims in the center of the village, a mosaic showing an American helicopter and terrified villagers, and the ditch where more than 100 civilians were herded like cattle and gunned down in cold blood. 170 people were marched down in there, women, old men, babies. GI stood up on the side with their weapons on full automatic and machine gun fire. There were no weapons captured. There were no draft gauge males killed. They were, they were civilians. And when Colburn and Thompson radioed for help for the wounded, they were stunned to see the GIs of Charlie Company come back instead to finish off the civilians. One of the men doing the shooting that day was Private Paul Meadlow. I talked with him back in 1969. I might have killed about uh, 10, 15 of them. Men, women, and children. Men, women, and children. And babies. And babies. Why did you do it? Why did I do it? Because I felt like I was ordered to do it. Well, at the time, I felt like I was doing the right thing. I did. Because, uh, like I said, I lost place. The day after the massacre, Meadlow lost a foot in a mine explosion. His punishment, he thought, for his role in the massacre. You married? All right. Children? Two. How can a father of two young children shoot babies? I don't know. It's just one of them. Hugh Thompson was thinking about his family back home when his crew chief, Glenn Andriotta, saw a young child alive in the ditch. Thompson landed his chopper immediately, and Andriotta jumped out. 
Glenn, without hesitation, went into the ditch and waded over to the child who was still... Ditch full of bodies? Yes, sir. Oh, it was full, sir. Uh, full of blood? Yes, sir. Some of the people were still... They were dying. They weren't all dead. And Glenn got to the child and picked him up and... It was a boy? I, I think it was a little boy, yes. I remember thinking that I had a son, you know, that same age. And uh, as Thompson was recalling the horrors of that day, an elderly woman walked toward us. She said that she had been dumped in the ditch back in 1968, but had survived, shielded by the bodies of the dead and dying. And he went to, to meet the Thompson, a good man. She wants to meet Mr. Yeah. Thompson. Well, here is Mr. Thompson. Very, very glad Hello, ma'am. Nice to meet you. Sorry we couldn't help you that day. Thank you very much. Thank you, baby. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> why she wanted to know were so many villagers killed that day, and why was Thompson different from the rest of the Americans? I, I saved the people because I would not talk to murder and kill. I can't answer for the people who took part in it. And I apologize for the ones who did. I just wish we could have helped more people that day. In fact, they did help more people. Thompson and Colburn found 10 villagers cowering in a bunker. They radioed for a couple of choppers, which airlifted all of them to safety. I'm so sorry. And we managed to find two of the women they'd saved. Mrs. Nome, who was 73 now, was 43 when she was rescued. Mrs. Nong was only six. You were very small then. You were at the entrance. This is Larry. This is Larry. He was with me that day. <laughs> Thank you very much once again for your great help. Didn't you take your life in your hands, Hugh, when you got out and told the American soldiers who had been killing that they'd, they'd better quit and let these people get out of the bunker? Did you want to answer that, Larry, didn't you? Yes, sir, he did. And he, he didn't even take a weapon with him. He, he had a sidearm. He didn't even have it drawn. He just placed himself in harm's path. And I was thinking that uh, at that point, anything could have happened. And we watched Mr. Thompson go to the bunker and, and bring the people out. And, and you had seen all of these bodies before then, so that you knew what was going on. It was pretty obvious what was going to happen if he didn't take action when he did. And Well, what would have happened is that these two women would not have survived, and these children would not be here. What a sense of joy and satisfaction it must be for the two of you guys. A lot of joy, a lot of satisfaction, and a lot of hurt, too. You know, I, I know the numbers that didn't make it, and it was, it was meaningless uh, for the people that were taking part.